Welcome to Private Club Radio, the industry's first and only program dedicated to education, news, events, trends and announcements. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. A big shout out to all the fathers out there. Happy Father's Day to the fathers, to the grandfathers, to the great grandfathers. If there's any of those listening to this show, happy Father's Day to you. And I hope you enjoyed the U.S. Open on Father's Day. And a big congratulations to Dustin Johnson. I don't know how he got through that round. I'm calling it a dress gate. So if you didn't watch it, what happened was Dustin Johnson addressed his ball on the fifth green. And he made a few practice putting strokes. And all of a sudden, the ball moved about a millimeter behind him. And the USGA seven holes later on the 12th hole comes up to him and says, well, we may give you a one-stroke penalty, but we're not going to determine that until the end of the round. So he had that in his head. And, of course, all the rest of the players don't know what is the score, what's the actual score. It was just a really bad situation. And then you've got pro golfers like Rory McIlroy, some of the big superstars of the game, Ricky Fowler and Jordan Spieth chiming in on Twitter about it. It just seemed like to me sort of a black eye on the tournament and sort of a distraction, in my opinion, and I want to really drive that point home that this is my opinion. I think that if we don't really address what the spirit of the rules are, the rules of the game of golf, we're never going to move this industry forward. And of course, golf is only a part of the private club industry, but it's a big part of the private club industry. And it's already sort of something that is tough for people to understand those rules of golf and all the different intricacies and nuances of the game. Why make it any harder for them to understand it? I don't know. Uh, That's just my opinion, of course, as I mentioned. But I think uh, things like this really need to be taken a good look at, you know, because, listen, the ball moved back a millimeter. It did not improve his lie. It didn't give him any extra advantage. It was really a non-point. I don't know. Maybe we need to take another look at the rules of golf. Uh, I'm by no means a purist myself. I think there there should be a little bit of flexibility built in. And of course, it's just my opinion, but I don't want to dissuade people from playing a wonderful sport because of the rules. Anyways, it's almost fitting that Brad Steele will be our guest today on the show. He's the Vice President of Government Relations for the National Club Association. So, of course, being in Washington and being amongst the government, it's going to be something right up his alley that we're talking this on the day after this U.S. Open ruling. On today's show, Brad and I are going to discuss some pretty important new rulings and new legislation that's rolling out that affects you at the private club. First, we've got the Department of Labor's overtime exemption rule and what that means to your club, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency's Waters of the United States. And we're going to talk about some of Obamacare legislation and a few other things that will interest you and that you need to know to be prepared because there are a lot of new things happening. Speaking of new things happening, I'm proud to announce next week, one week from today, we are going to be rolling out a new segment on Private Club Radio called The Inbox. We're going to be joined by Rick Coffey once a month. Rick, you probably heard on episode six, is the M3 manager at Club Essential, and he is a marketing expert. He's the past president of the PCMA, and he has an incredible resume in terms of membership and marketing. Each week, Rick and I are going to open up our inbox, and that inbox is going to consist of your questions, you the listener, questions that you submit. And if you have a question about membership, about marketing, about the private club industry that you want Rick and I to discuss on this show, all you have to do is go to privateclubradio.com slash inbox and leave us a voicemail. You can leave a 90-second voicemail of your question that you want Rick and I to answer right on this show. It's available right now for you. Just go to privateclubradio.com slash inbox. Turn on your microphone and leave us a message. We'd love to hear from you. We want to answer your questions. I think it's going to be a really fun segment for everyone each month. The other exciting new thing going on, of course, if you haven't 
been listening to Private Club Radio is our webinar series. The first one is Marketing to Millennials. If you are looking to bring younger members to your club to attract the millennial generation and their families, you are going to want to attend this webinar. It's going to happen on July 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. The cost is only $49. But since you are listening to Private Club Radio this week, I have something very special for you. Simply enter the promo code PCR25, and I'm going to give you 25% off the registration fee. This subject matter is so important to the private club industry because there's so many clubs that I work with that their biggest fear is that their membership is aging out, and they just can't replace their members with younger ones quick enough. And I want every club to have all the facts, to have all the data, and to have an arsenal of tools to attract younger members to their club. So just simply enter PCR25, PCR stands for Private Club Radio, of course. Enter PCR25 at checkout, 25% off. If you want to learn more information, if you want to see a little video preview of what you're going to learn during the webinar, simply go to privateclubradio.com slash millennials. I really hope you can attend. I promise that you'll get every penny of your investment back in terms of value tenfold. I'm joined today by Brad Steele. He's the Vice President of Government Relations and General Counsel at the National Club Association. As the National Club Association's chief lawyer and lobbyist, Brad brings a wealth of knowledge from the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government to the position of Vice President of Government Relations and General Counsel. Brad earned his bachelor's in government and politics from George Mason University, where he graduated with the highest distinction. He then began his time in government by working for the Vice President of the United States for a member of Congress and then as a senior staffer with a national political committee. After many years in politics, Brad left D.C. to become an attorney. He studied law in England at Oxford University, and he earned his degree from the University of Oklahoma. Upon graduation, Brad opened his law firm in Indiana, where he practiced for over a decade. In addition to his private practice, Brad also served as a county, city, and town attorney and as a judge of Indiana's court. While in Indiana, Brad returned to the political arena as a candidate for the United States Congress and the Indiana State House of Representatives. In 2007, Brad joined the NCA and has served as the voice of the private club industry on Capitol Hill for the past nine years. Brad, welcome to Private Club Radio. Well, thank you very much. That guy sounds really important. Who, who did you introduce? Because that, that's not me. You've got no, a lot going on, Brad. <laughs> uh, just, uh, I always like to tell folks it's the red wine that just keeps me uh, looking young because that uh, that sounds like it's a lot of stuff for me. But at the end of the day, it's uh, it's been a great uh, life so far, and I'm very happy to to be doing what I'm doing. And more more importantly, I'm happy to be uh, with you, Gabe. So uh, I hope Excellent. we have a good show today. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm happy to have you, and I think you're the most educated man we've had on this program. So I'm happy to have you, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> that, that just means the show has now lost many of its listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brad, this is an election year. As we all know, we've got races in the House, the Senate, and of course, for President of the United States. Are there any key races out there that folks in the private club industry should be taking note of? Well, it's certainly a, an extremely uh, a fascinating time from uh, a perspective aside from the presidential race, because certainly currently in the House of Representatives, uh, sort of the balance of power is 247 Republicans, 188 Democrats. Of course, all of those members are up for re-election on November 8th. The 247 seats by the Republicans actually is the most that the Republican Party has had in the House since 1947. Wow. So what that really means, and interestingly enough, uh, that in 2014, obviously the policies, the perspectives that a lot of those candidates brought forward resonated. So it will be interesting to see, uh, because of the presidential race, just how many of those seats will be maintained in the Republican column. Sure. Now, the National Club Association isn't, you know, we're nonpartisan, you know, whoever helps clubs the best, we help. Uh, but at the end of the day, certainly uh, the more pro-growth, pro-business oriented policymakers have been more beneficial for us. That has been the case in the House when it turned Republican. So certainly we're uh, we're interested to see what happens, but I can tell you, at least from our perspective, even though this presidential race will, will be very interesting and will have an impact on down-ballot races, we still don't believe 
that that 247 seat to, to 188 seat majority is going to flip from Republican to Democrat. Uh, that that would require a 30 seat change, a net 30 seat change for the uh, Democrats to take control, and that that will be very difficult, we think, for them to do. So. From a private club perspective, uh, that means that we're going to have, uh, a, a, number one, we expect still a very, very solid pro-growth, pro-business, pro-club, lower chamber of the uh, of Congress supporting our issues and our, our uh, uh, you know, desires. Well, that's really been important for us, because in the past, having that one megaphone, the House of Representatives talking about our issues, our allies on the Hill and the House being champions for us have really helped to push some of the measures that we wanted passed, at least through the front door of the United States House. The, the problem has always been the United States Senate. And in the past, at least prior to 2014, uh, it has not been as pro-club, pro-growth, or pro-business. Mm. But in 2014, that changed. And I think that's going to be a, a real benefit for us as we go forward, at least it has been for the last two years, because it's given us an opportunity for that second megaphone. So you've got the House of Representatives talking about our issues, bringing notoriety to those issues, and then we've had the United States Senate in the last two years doing the same. Uh, whether the United States Senate continues in uh, its capacity as a pro-growth, pro-club chamber of Congress, that's the $64,000 question, and probably even more important, than the presidency. Sure. Who, what friends do we have there on Capitol Hill? I know you just uh, did a, I think it was National Golf Day, and you took some folks around to the Senate and the Congress, and we're meeting with some of these folks. Uh, who out there uh, is 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 somebody that folks need to be putting a vote in the ballot box for? Well, I can tell you that, that uh, during National Golf Day, we were pleased to join uh, our friends and allies from the Club Managers Association of America, and, uh, and I'd set up meetings with uh, our, our friends in the Speaker, uh, Speaker Ryan's office, uh, in the uh, House Majority Leader's office, Kevin McCarthy from California, and uh, senior staffers at uh, Senator House Whip Scalise's, Steve Scalise's office. So we've got the one, two, and three in the United States House of Representatives that were very interested in our issues and certainly are the kind of people you want to talk to because they're the ones who are going to schedule the floor time, determine what bills get forward. And obviously, uh, in the case of uh, Steve Scalise as the whip, uh, it will be the one who generates the numbers. You need 218 votes to pass anything in the House of Representatives, and that's what the whip's job is. So we spoke with the right people on the House side, on the Senate side, we had the pleasure of speaking to the number three in the Senate leadership the chief there, uh, he, Senator Ch- uh, John Thune from uh, not a very large club state, I have to say, mm-hmm. uh, the state of South Dakota. But uh, but he's a, an extremely important player, obviously, in the United States Senate, so we're happy to spend some time with him. He is the Republican conference chair, and again, number three in the Senate, as well as the uh, chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Now, a lot of folks uh, here... Uh, appropriations and, you know, the spending bills and what Congress does or doesn't do, at the end of the day, the spending bill, the appropriations bills, are are those that keep the government going. And what we've often found in the last four to to six years has been the most important committee is the Appropriations Committee traditionally because it will fund the government. But it's been most important for us in the club industry because that's where we've been able to put in riders that state no funds will go to enforce certain laws or certain regulations. So it's actually the appropriations process where it spends money, but we've been most successful in having the appropriations process stop the spending of federal money on certain bills. So that's been a, an area that we were, were pleased to sit down with the, the chief of staff for the chairman. Uh, that's Chairman uh, Thad Cochran from uh, Miss, Mississippi. Uh, so those are areas uh, that are, are you know, not often thought of in the club industry, but indeed extremely important when you get down to the nitty gritty of uh, you know, what has to be done. If we can't get a bill passed or if a bill has passed that's detrimental to us, then we need to stop funding for it. That, that's really where we found ourselves struggling, because at this point, sometimes the administration isn't as interested in passing our bills, or when they do pass legislation that's detrimental to us, they aren't willing to make changes to it, which means the only place left for us to go is to try to cut back on funding, stop the funding so that the, the bill or the regulation isn't fully implemented. And that's really why it was so important to spend some time with the chief staffer for uh, Chairman Cochran uh, of the Appropriations Committee, because that's where we're really spending a lot of our time. Well, there was a big uh, announcement from the Department of Labor just recently about the overtime exemption rule. Can you sort of lay what that means for clubs? 
sure, and that, and that uh, to say the least, is uh, is probably one of the major areas where we uh, at the National Club Association and our allies in the golf industry and in the business community will be spending a lot of time with Chairman Cochran <laughs> and uh, and uh, his counterpart uh, in the uh, uh, House uh, Appropriations Committee, Hal Rogers, uh, Republican from Kentucky, uh, to sort of say, look, we we need to stop funding for the overtime uh, uh, exemption rule. That rule is uh, uh, relatively detrimental to not only clubs, but most importantly to the employees of those clubs. And yeah. What we've consistently said to members of Congress about this particular rule is that at the end of the day, it, it, it sounds well and good to say more individuals should be entitled to receive overtime, but the practical effect is such that it will not provide those individuals who may be now more eligible to receive it from actually getting the money. Right. So you may be entitled to it, but you ain't going to get it. And if you're not going to get it, that has a significant impact on those individual employees. And that's what we tried to convey. Specifically, what the rule will do is, uh, it will, well, as you all know, to be exempt from overtime, you have to meet three requirements. First, you've got to be paid a salary. So any hourly wage employee mm -hmm. is always going to be entitled to overtime. Yeah. Secondly, if you're salaried, you got to be uh, you got to meet a certain minimum weekly salary that you receive. So it's a constant amount, regardless of the hours you work, regardless of the work that you do. Every single week, you've got to reach a specific amount. Currently, that amount is four hundred and fifty-five dollars per week. The change has increased at four fifty-five to nine hundred and thirteen dollars wow. per week. That's almost double. It is a hundred percent increase, absolutely, and it's uh, that's that's the difficulty. The third aspect to be exempt from overtime is that you have to meet the primary duties test of a white collar employee. So the reality is, when you look at what the, the this new rule does, is it changes not the fact that you have to be salaried that stayed the same. It didn't change the fact that you have to meet the uh, primary duty test of a white-collar employee. That stayed the same. But as you noted, Gabe, it had a 100% increase yeah. uh, wow. of the minimum weekly salary. So that means that club employees across the United States, any salaried club employee making less than $913 per week, will now be entitled to receive overtime pay if that individual works over 40 hours per week. And that's about forty-seven thousand dollars, I guess. Something yeah, and exactly what what uh, you know, we we always want to make sure that that uh, those individuals in the industry know that while we're used to thinking a yearly salary, the fact remains that this particular rule deals with one particular increment of time. That is the forty-hour work week. So it's really down to nine thirteen per week. But if you multiply that by fifty-two weeks, then the yearly salary is forty-seven thousand. Four hundred and seventy-six dollars per year. Now, the National Club Association has, has certainly felt that the current minimum weekly salary of four hundred and fifty-five dollars, which equals about twenty-three thousand six hundred and sixty a year, is low, mm -hmm. and, and we believe that that needed to be increased because anybody making only twenty-three thousand six hundred and sixty, or more than that, would be exempt from overtime. Right. Well, that's not really a wage where somebody should be exempt from overtime when they're working 45 or 50 or 60 hours a week. So we certainly understand that there needs to be a change to the, the minimum weekly salary, but we certainly don't agree with a over 100% increase and a start date six months from now, starting December 1st, 2016. Right. So that's really where we've had the, the biggest concern with this particular rule because as I say, it, it's just going to cause a significant problem for a lot of individual employees because now uh, there will be some significant problems and changes that will, will have to come about from general managers or employers at clubs. I think probably one of the, the most obvious one that I know a lot of, of our clubs are calling me about is the fact that they're going to turn around now and, and really have to start to determine if I've got an individual who, let's say, makes $40,000 a year, so $7,000, know, basically $500 less than the threshold. Mm -hmm. What I have to do is one of two things. I'm either going to need to bump him up to 47476 which is, again, a $7,000, basically $500 raise, or I'm going to have to track that individual's hours so that in the event he works more than 40 hours, I know to pay him overtime. Right. I mean, I, you know, most of those folks, if they're salaried, they don't clock in and clock out. Exactly. We don't know how many hours they work. Uh, so uh, you, know, you can imagine how difficult it's going to be uh, if you've got an individual who may not be bumped up to 47500 
but instead may stay at forty or forty two thousand, but then being certain that as the employer, you know, I've paid this individual correctly because I know the exact number of hours that he's worked. Right. And the only real way to do that, Gabe, and this is what's really unfortunate, is to take that salaried employee and make him hourly. Uh, and when you do that, that is a demotion to most employees. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I always ask folks uh, when I when I speak across the country, well, what's the first home phone call that you made when you went from an hourly wage position to a salary position? And most of these folks are in clubs. So if they go from, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, an hourly wage busser, but they move up to, you know, or, or the server, and they move up to the mater d'. Well, the first call they make is to mom. Sure. Say, I made it. You know, look <laughs> exactly. what I did. This is great, right? I yep. made it. They, they, they love me. They think I'm good. Look what I've done. You know, even though we all know at the end of the day, guess what you didn't do? You didn't make more money because, you know, <laughs> you're, you're losing yeah. the hourly wage and the overtime. <laughs> right, exactly. You get those perks, but you don't really care about those perks at 24, 25 years old. Right. But you still feel satisfied. Mm-hmm. You feel great, right? Hey, I made it. I hit the big league. I, you know, I finished college and look what I got. I got a salary job. Well, now how would you like to tell, and, uh, you know, like let's say a sous chef? at a club. Congratulations, chef. I really appreciate the work you're going to do. Unfortunately, I'm going to drop you from salary to hourly. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. I would suggest you do that Do that when he doesn't have the uh, paring knife in his hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some of them are going to stick around and some are going to leave. It's going to, you're going to have to exactly. make, make some um, important decisions there for sure. Yeah, that's really, I think, what, what, what the unintended consequence of this particular rule is. And, and we've told the administration that time and time again, that we would certainly hope they look at it from a, a broader perspective. Sure, the rule says if you're going to bump from 455 per week to $913 per week, more individuals are going to be entitled to overtime. We see that. Obviously, those individuals making, let's say, $650 per week. Right. They are now entitled to overtime. We're starting, starting December 1st. They will be entitled to overtime. Yes, those making $700, $800 a week, they would now be entitled to overtime. So those individuals certainly are capable of now receiving overtime. But guess what? Those individuals have never received overtime in the past. And if they've never received overtime in the past, there's going to be a significant concern on the part of the employer about that cost that is associated with providing that overtime pay. Well, when that happens, I have to then start to think about moving them, as we discussed, from salary to hourly to make sure I get the hours right, because you got to trust but verify. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about trust. I can't screw this up because if I screw it up, I'm in violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So that's a big problem. Mm-hmm. So I got to make sure that I pay them correctly the hours they worked. And I'm, I don't suggest that employees at clubs are untruthful, but any prudent business person is going to have to verify the hours. So I got to drop them probably from salary to hourly. I then have to figure out, well, am I even going to work them 40 hours? And if I can't work them 40 hours, what does that mean? Right? That individual doesn't get the overtime that they would now be entitled to. Right. And so, God forbid either. Mother's Day rolled around or the July exactly. 4th or something and you got a late night. Yeah. It's going to have to make some interesting decisions for sure. Can you imagine? I mean, and that's, that's something that every club, you know, every club general manager, every club clubhouse manager, every club employee knows he or she does not work on holiday or works on holiday. They don't get those days off. And now, now the club's going to have to say, well, wait a minute. I mean, you don't get any extra money for, for it being Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. But the reality is you, you have to worry about the hours the individual is working before then. You right. know you're going to have a high turnout of, of customers. Mm-hmm. So there are going to be a lot of jobs that have to be done. Uh, you're going to have to potentially change the perspective of your members at clubs. You know, I'm used to seeing Bobby behind the bar on Friday, Saturday, you know, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He's the best bartender. Love him. Makes the best doers on the rocks in the world. Did you get it? Mm-hmm. Doers on the rocks. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the reality is if the chairman of the board says, well, where's Bobby, the best bartender? And the general manager has to say, well, you know, or the F&B has to say, well, well you know, Bobby also works Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we, we, you know, we're, we're, he's maxing out at 50 or 60 hours a week. And we don't, you know, that's not a position that we have uh, provided traditionally overtime for. Now you've got a problem. Uh, you know, your members have to make some adjustments and that may not be comfortable for clubs to do. Yeah. Uh, so it's really a significant impact all based on this supposition that I think the administration said 4.2 million more Americans would be entitled to receive overtime. Well, yeah, I mean, they may be entitled, but they ain't going to get it right. if they don't work it. Exactly. And uh, and that's a business decision that clubs have to make. And uh, 
Boy, I tell you, we're, we're, we're hearing from a lot of clubs that it's, it's going to disrupt their employees' shifts. Uh, it's going to disrupt uh, their staffing levels. And it's going to uh, disrupt the compensation packages that employees are currently getting. So it's really unfortunate. And that's something that we're now speaking with Appropriations Chairman Cochran about, all right, well, let's, let's put in a provision of a, a rider that says, you know, no funding for this rule. We need to reevaluate mm-hmm. how this rule is going to impact American employees uh, and businesses, uh, let alone nonprofits and educational institutions uh, that are just reeling over this. Uh, so it's, it's an opportunity for us to continue to work our relationships with uh, those on the Hill to, uh, to sort of add a, uh, this, this sort of last saving line of defense for us. Yeah, uh, what's the last-ditch effort or what's the silver <clears throat> lining? What, what can actually be done? It, it, could this go to like a congressional vote or a bill being passed? Where do you see this going? <laughs> well, I think the difficulty is certainly there are, there are a couple of, of uh, mechanisms already in play in the House and in the United States Senate. The first is uh, Re- Senator uh, Tim Scott, a longtime supporter of private, the private club industry, he's Republican from South Carolina, and uh, Representative uh, Wahlberg, who's from a, a congressman from Minnesota, who has both stepped forward and introduced uh, the Protecting Workplace Advancement and Opportunity Act. This is a bill, mirror, mirror language in both the House and the Senate, that would specifically say, hold it, rules got to stop. This overtime exemption rules got to stop. The Department of Labor needs to go back to the drawing boards and really do an economic impact analysis on small businesses because we don't believe you did one. Mm-hmm. And between you and me and your listeners, Gabe, they didn't do one. I know they didn't <laughs> okay. do one. This was, this Inside was, information uh, this here was, on Private Club Radio. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. This was, this was all pretty much straightforward coming from the White House as a, as a desire to to you know, be a legacy issue for for President Obama, sure. uh, and you know, his perspective is you, you can grow the economy by broadening the uh, the, the, the take home pay of middle Americans. We, we certainly think that's a good thing, but at the end of the day, it, he didn't really understand how it would work, and that's where the unintended consequences come. So both Senator Scott and Representative Wahlberg have introduced this legislation. Now we know that there is significant support in the House of Representatives for the workplace uh, protecting workplace. Uh, uh, Advancement and Opportunity Act. So there should be no question that that's going to pass the House. It may have difficulty uh, passing the United States Senate. But even if it were to pass the United States Senate, the president has already indicated that he would veto the bill. Mm. So we know that that's one avenue that's that's closed off for us. So the okay. second one has come about uh, anytime a regulation has been issued, and, and this overtime exemption rule is a regulation, anytime a regulation is issued, the United States Congress has the opportunity to say, well, wait a minute, we are the elected representatives of the American people, and we are the, you know, the House of Representatives most close to the American people. You know, There's about 700,000 individuals in each congressional district. So that's their most direct contact to the federal government. Right. So the House and the Senate both have a mechanism that they can use that says, well, wait a minute, we think this regulation is awful. <laughs> we don't like it. <laughs> yep. uh, and it's called the uh, Congressional Review Act. Mm-hmm. So that Congressional Review Act provides for the House and the Senate to have a joint resolution of disapproval. So if both chambers file this joint resolution of disapproval, and if it passes, then it goes to the president, and the president would then have the opportunity to sign it. And if he did sign it, it would then remove the overtime exemption rule from the books. Mm-hmm. Senate uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Chairman Lamar Alexander from Tennessee uh, has introduced the legislation in the Senate, starting in the Senate. Uh, and the great news about uh, Congressional Review Act resolution is that it can't be filibustered. I know your listeners are aware of the requirement to stop a filibuster. You need 60 votes to do so. In a Congressional Review Act joint resolution of disapproval, you don't. You just need a simple majority, meaning there can be no filibuster of this CRA joint resolution of disapproval. So we're wow. happy about that, meaning mm-hmm. that's going to pass, right? So we guarantee that that's going to pass the United States Senate. And let me tell you, there ain't too many times that I can tell you I guarantee sure. you something's <laughs> going to pass the right. United States Senate. <laughs> so that's that's going to get through the Senate, and obviously with a, a pro-growth, pro-business House of Representatives, uh, there's no doubt that it will pass the House of Representatives. So now we will have uh, a resolution that says the Elected officials of the American people do not like the overtime exemption rule. 
It passed the Senate. It passed the House. Same bill. Uh, we believe, Mr. President, therefore you need to sign this and remove this rule. Now, what do you think the president's going to do? <laughs> Probably going to veto it like he said he would, right? <laughs> exactly. Since he's the one who, who uh, uh, directed the Department of Labor to create this overtime exemption rule, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's really not likely that the president is going to go forward and actually sign the joint resolution of disapproval. So it will be a, another opportunity for the Congress to say, look, we, we think there's some serious problems with this rule. The economic impact analysis on small businesses wasn't done. The impact on employees wasn't thought out. The impact on businesses like clubs was not thought out. Uh, And there needs to be a significant review and and retooling. Uh, But I'm afraid, even though that's going to hit the news and people are going to talk about it, the president is not going to sign it. So from Congress and from the legislative branch, we're pretty much out of luck. Mm Mm-hmm. So if you don't have the legislative branch, you've got to go to the executive branch. Well, the executive branch is what is that which created the rule. Right. The executive branch is the White House. So that ain't, that's done. Third option would be the judicial branch, and we certainly don't think this is any way to run a railroad. But at the end of the day, what we've consistently had to do is try to have uh, uh, lawsuits filed in uh, uh, federal court to say, look, we don't think you followed the rule. We don't think that you created the, this rule uh, appropriately. And uh, you know, we've had some success in those areas on other regulations that this administration has proposed. Mm-hmm. But the problem with this particular regulation is that the Department of Labor has really unfettered authority to determine who will or will not be exempt from overtime. And indeed, the, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act specifically says, you know, the authority to determine how any overtime exemption will be issued comes from the Department of Labor. So there isn't much that they've done wrong in this particular rule. Uh, They haven't done anything that goes against the authorizing legislation that gives them the right to do this. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of boxed in a corner. Sounds like it. It sounds like I'll tell you what was interesting. I was at a hearing on, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday of last week, in the the House uh, Education and the Workforce Committee, a very powerful committee, one that obviously you can imagine, education and the workforce, uh, was dealing with the overtime uh, rule. And the chairman, John Klein, also from Minnesota, uh, made a very interesting sort of comment to the witnesses before they began their testimony, is that while this particular rule only changed the weekly minimum salary threshold from 455 to 913, it also includes an automatic increase every three years of that minimum weekly salary. Oh, wow. But what's fascinating about that is that there is no opportunity for notice to the general public or to stakeholders and an opportunity for those stakeholders or the general public to have a comment about the proposed increase. So uh, I noticed that a lot of the lawyers uh, from our coalition uh, and uh, those in the hearing all started to think, wait a minute, while we thought that there was really a great opportunity or, or there was no, I should say there was no opportunity for us to be successful in court, because guess what? The Department of Labor is granted the authority to change who does or doesn't get overtime. Wow, the chairman actually made a good point. This every three-year increase isn't authorized in the law. The law says you can make a change with notice and comment. Mm-hmm. So well, does that mean the whole thing can get it. thrown out then, or, or what does that actually no, mean? I, I, the, the real bad news is I think that if we decide to challenge it, we got to do a little more review to see if that's even plausible. But if we were to ch- decide to challenge it, I think all that would be thrown out would be the automatic Increase okay. every three years. Yeah. Okay. So the the change from 455 to 913 still holds. If they wanted to change uh, that 913 to something else, all they would need to do, all I say that in quotes, but all they would need to do uh, would be to provide notice that they are doing so and give us an opportunity as stakeholders to comment on it. Hmm. So it was just interesting that the chairman actually said because that's all, you know that's something that's you know we had we got nothing you know sure. we got nothing that we really have an opportunity to be successful on in the courts. Uh, until the chairman mentioned, oh, by the way, I don't think 
under the law that you can just automatically increase. You can come back every year and say, we're going to change it and give us notice and the right to comment on it, Mm -hmm. but you can't just do it automatically. So that may be an avenue we would go, but again, the only problem there is I think if we were successful, all that would happen is they would just throw out the courts would just throw out the automatic increase. Now that's not a that's not a small thing. Understand that right now the Department of Labor has said that in three years' time, when the automatic increase goes into effect, starting January one two thousand twenty, the minimum weekly salary would be nine hundred eighty one dollars per week. So it's a it's a significant change and and indeed something that uh, you know we we wouldn't mind having removed sure. uh, this automatic increase, but you know from uh, the the immediacy of all this our our bigger concern is the nine hundred and thirteen dollars per week. It is there. It's not really challengeable under the courts. So we can't get anything from the legislative branch. The executive branch created the rule. Mm-hmm. Judicial branch we really don't have anything out there. So all that's really left now is an opportunity to speak with the Senate Appropriations Chairman uh, Thad Cochran, see if we can't get a rider in there that stops the rule by, by not providing any funding. And that's the only time we'll find out whether that works or doesn't is the final negotiations uh, probably Dece- December 31st <laughs> um, when they finally uh, you know, get through the election and uh, you know, are in that, that, that final push of, oh, goodness, we really need to do something right. uh, with funding the government. And, uh, and this will be probably one of the last things that will be on the negotiating table. And you give us this, we'll give you that. We'll give you funding for X. If you remove funding for the overtime rule, right? Uh, Sounds like you're gonna not, have a couple uh, all-nighters, Brad, <laughs> at the end of the year. Yeah, I'm, I'm not real confident that's gonna happen. So, uh, so maybe <laughs> there won't be two all night, too, okay. too long of uh, all-nighters, but it's out there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, we got to move on a little bit here. So, let's talk about the Environmental Protection Agency's Waters of the United States rule. What kind of impact could this potentially make for clubs? Well, I'll tell you the, the, the good news and the, 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 that I want everybody to know is that at least at this point, the Sixth Circuit, you know, again, we've, we've had to go to court, right? Again, not the way to run a railroad, but we've had to go to court. Uh, the Sixth Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals has indeed stopped the rule, which is great. The bad news is the, the rule is still on the books. Uh, once we have a final determination from that court relating to whether this rule is done correctly, we'll know exactly uh, how much more clubs have to worry about it. But uh, to say the least, the overall a- aspect of this particular rule is really unfortunate. It really, the Waters of the United States rule simply redefines water. And I don't know about you, but I don't know how the hell they could do that. Right. <laughs> water is water. Water is water. <laughs> H2O? No. It, it, that's what I heard. I remember my chemistry class. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. So the reality is now they've decided that, well, what, what traditionally was water covered under the Clean Water Act was water that was navigable water, so I think I can put a boat in interstate water like the Mississippi River or territorial seas like the you know the the the, the Lake Huron or Erie or whatever. Right. Well, as the Supreme Court looked at this and as cases rolled along, they also decided to include things downstream water. So downstream water uh, would fall under the definition of covered water under the Clean Water Act. So if there's anything that actually would go into that downstream water that would significantly affect the chemical or physical or biological integrity of our traditional navigable water or interstate water or territorial seas, well, that's downstream water. And if you, if you contaminate downstream water, forget it. That's, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So we got traditional waters, and now we got downstream waters. Well, congratulations. This new rule now includes upstream water. So I don't know about you, Gabe, but if I got upstream water, downstream water, and territorial waters, that's, that's pretty, pretty much, much all the water, water there is. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo. And and that's been the problem. My pool. That, um, <laughs> it, yeah, and let me tell you, they're looking at that one. So just you know, cover it up if you can. <laughs> right. Put some shrubs around it. Um, they they really have gone uh, to that extent, and and that certainly means some ponds, some creeks uh, on golf courses will now be under EPA control, and that simply means you know for any club that, you know, surprise, uses chemicals or fertilizers or pesticides on their course. Well, who would do that, right? Right. Uh, they're going to have to worry about runoff of those chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides into the water on the course. Mm-hmm. Because when it gets there, potentially, that water then would be contaminated and you'd be in violation of the Clean Water Act. So it, it really is a concern because now... Clubs are going to have to start to deal with permits from the Environmental Protection Agency, permits from their state department of environmental departments or department of water, 
uh, and uh, issuances from the Army Corps, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers before they used chemicals, or fertilizers, or pesticides. Uh, it's really unfortunate because that's never been something that has happened before. And of course, as your listeners know, guess what? We, we take care of our land. We take care of our water. We, are, we actually are the best conservationists out there. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, we can't make money. Sure. If the course isn't good, isn't healthy, uh, if the water isn't clean, and if we can't take care of the environment surrounding the water and the golf course. So it, it has really been very, very difficult for, uh, for all of us because of some of the ways in which these, uh, this, this brand new rule has been brought forward, the kind of water, uh, defining some of the, the, this new uh, upstream water. I mean, tributaries. A tributary is something that has a bank, a bed, an ordinary high water mark, and flows directly or, get this, indirectly <laughs> to protected water. Well, you know, oh, come on, guys. That just doesn't make much sense. And that, that also includes ephemeral streams. So that means something where on the 15th fairway, if I have a, a, you know, a, a grade that always, always causes a stream to come flowing down the 15th when it's a heavy rain, congratulations. It's an ephemeral stream, and you've got to worry about the chemicals and fertilizers that might be going on the 15th that can go into that if you've got a rain, right. that you know, ephemeral stream, that thing that just sort of pops up when it rains. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really uh, very difficult for superintendents to, uh, to get a hold of and very difficult for uh, club general managers to have to deal with considering they've never, never had to deal with uh, permits from the EPA in the past. Really not fun. So what, how are you guys working uh, with, with that rule? Is it mostly just giving these clubs guidance or is there something you're actually doing to combat this rule from the EPA? Sure, we've got a couple of, uh, of avenues. Obviously, uh, you know, we, we would like to go through the same same kind of thought process that we did with regards to the overtime uh, exemption rule. First, we've gone through Congress and we've uh, discussed exactly how bad this rule is. We've got a lot of allies, both Democrat and Republican, who understand that this is this is a big step from the from the EPA, a little more overreach than was expected. And indeed, in response to that, another one of those Congressional Review Acts. So an opportunity for members of the House of Representatives in the Senate to say, wait a minute, we understand the executive branch created this regulation, but we're the elected representatives of the people, and we don't like this rule. Well, not only did that pass the House and pass the Senate with large majorities, uh, you know, we felt confident the president might listen, but, you know, shocker, I know this will surprise you, Gabe. <laughs> the, the, the president vetoed that joint resolution of disapproval. So as we expect with the Congressional Review Act joint resolution of disapproval with the overtime exemption rule, we got the veto from the Congressional Review Act joint resolution of disapproval for the WOTUS rule. So we tried, didn't work. Second okay. option that we've, we've now pursued is uh, much like the uh, overtime exemption rule. We've gone to Appropriations Chairman Cochran and asked for defunding of the rule so no funds can be used to enforce or implement the rule. Uh, in April of this year, there actually was the first vote on defunding that measure. Unfortunately, it lost 56 to 42. Now, you might say 56 does not, is the majority, Brad. Doesn't that mean it should work? Well, remember that filibuster. Right. And unlike that Congressional Review Act, you, you don't have to worry about filibuster in a Congressional Review Act. You do on everything else. And unfortunately, this first defunding measure uh, lost by four votes. So it came up four votes short of the 60. And even though we got 56 senators, Democrats, Republicans, to say, yeah, we, we need to not fund any uh, implementation or enforcement of this rule in 2017, in FY 2017, uh, we lost by four votes. So we, we still got other options, much like the uh, you know overtime exemption rule, you know I'm right up to the end of that that fiscal cliff, right, right, yep. December 31st uh, or whenever they do it. You know, heck, they can they can uh, pat, get patchwork funding measures to keep the government lights on for every month if they want. Uh, but you know, uh, at some point they're going to come up with a final uh, bill, and and this will be also on the table. You know, one of the last things that you know, you give us this, we'll give you that. You know, right. if, if you if you defund the Lotus Rule, we'll give you X. Right. Uh, and so we'll see. And then, yeah, there'll be another another late night. But uh, that's where we've been with the legislative side. Obviously, the executive branch, you know what's going on there. After the president asked the Environmental Protection Agency to create the rule, so mm-hmm. the executive branch ain't going to change it. And uh, as I say, at this point, we're, we're waiting for further good news from the courts. This is the only regulatory uh, action that we've actually got some success on. The courts 
came forward and said, yep, we're really concerned with this rule. Why sure. don't you hold off on implementing it until we figure out if you guys screwed this up? Because unlike the overtime exemption rule, this one, they really overstepped their bounds. Right. No overstepping their bounds in the overtime. It's in the rule. They're a lot, they the law says they can determine who's exempt and who's not. But that's not what this particular uh, authorizing legislation said about EPA and, and taking every drop of water in the United States under the Clean Water Act. So yeah. we, we got... At least some favorable movement from the, the, the courts. We'll see what happens. All right. I'm glad to get a little bit of good news on this show. <laughs> All right. I want to move on to uh, the STARS Act. Can you tell us a little bit about the STARS Act and some of these other Obama fix-it bills? Sure. No, the Obamacare stuff uh, uh, is, is probably the, the, the thing that's been vexing private clubs for, well, since 2010 when the law passed. And I've spent way too much time on this uh, uh, for the last seven years, because it's it's you know as I say it's just the most important thing. Stars Act uh, is the simplifying technical aspects regarding seasonality. Oh, good gracious, that's a mouthful. <laughs> that that's sure why is. somebody came up with a, a hell of a good uh, acronym, Stars Act. I love that. That's great stuff. Right. So the Stars Act, actually, very good bill. Simple. Can you imagine a simple two-page bill? <laughs> it doesn't exist that, in Washington, that, I don't think. That doesn't happen. Yeah, that, you, you, you see, you know, that does not I happen right there. here. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, and you made it out alive. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. clears throat> this bill was introduced by Representative Jim Renassi from Ohio, Republican from Ohio, and Representative Kurt Schrader, a Democrat from Oregon. The bill does one very simple thing. It takes what is currently two definitions for the exact same employee. And makes it one definition. Well, wouldn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, and specifically, uh, currently under the uh, Obamacare, we got two definitions for the same person. One, uh, this deals with your seasonal uh, uh, staff. So surprise, occasionally clubs have season, seasonal staff, yeah, right? right? Unless you're in Florida. So we, we got it we, good we here. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, in Florida and everyplace else. Nah, so we have a season those, two, though. Summertime, they're, they're gone. Yep, that's a good season for you guys. I hear you. Uh, the, 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 the difficulty is when you've got employers, you know, general managers of clubs, who start to say to themselves, all right, if I am close to that 50 threshold, the threshold where I have to comply with Obamacare, if I've got 50 full-time, full-time equivalents, then I know I have to comply with the new health care law. End of story. So if I'm close to that number, well, I'm going to have to count up my full-time and full-time equivalents to figure out, well, am I at that number? Am I above it? Am I below it? Do I have to comply or not? If I don't have to comply, that'd be great because there are a lot of costs and a lot of effort that has to go into complying with Obamacare. So under the law, what it, the law says is this. If you are counting, if you're close to that, but you don't know, you're counting your full-time, full-time equivalents, you also have to count your, you have to count your seasonal workers, seasonal workers. Okay, so since the seasonal workers are going to be there probably working more than 30 hours or 40 hours or 50 or 60 hours a week, they're really full-time employees, but we know that they're not there the entire year. They're only there during the season. So what the rule says, I want you to add up all of your workers, your full-time, full-time uh, 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 equivalents and your seasonal workers, add them up, then I want you to divide by 12. Tell me what you got per month on average. If you're above 50, you got a problem. If you're below 50, you're fine. But if you're above 50, the law says, guess what? If you're above 50, but it's your seasonal workers who push you over that 50 threshold, you can actually remove those seasonal workers from the count, dump them, and redo the count. But nice. only if those seasonal workers are on property for four months or less. So if I got a club that has seasonal workers, let's say, uh, who come in May, June, July, and August, four months, and they are the ones who push me over that 50 threshold. Maybe I have 15 or 20 seasonal workers, maybe 30 seasonal workers that push me over that 50 threshold when I add them all up and divide by 12. If I remove those seasonal workers, well, I could be below that 50 threshold, right. which would be great news. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. We want to make sure that we know if we're close to that 50 threshold, if we're a smaller club, whether we do or do not meet that 50 threshold. So we like the fact that there is an ability to remove those seasonal workers, but only if those seasonal workers are on property for four months or less. Now, first of all, we all know it's not much of a season, four months. But, nope. you know, it's out there. Well, what if you are a club that has more than 50? Look, I know right off the bat I've got 75, not even counting my seasonal folks. 
I know I got 75 full-time or full-time equivalents. As such, there's nothing to count. You know you have to comply with Obamacare. In that case, the regulations, not the law, but the regulations say this. Hey, if you've got seasonal employees, seasonal employees who are in a position that's only open for six months or less, you don't have to offer them insurance, even though we know they're going to be working as seasonal staff. They're going to be working 40, 50, 60 hours. So they're certainly over the 30-hour threshold. But the reality is they're only on property working at a job that is open for six months or less. So I got two definitions, seasonal worker, seasonal employee. I got two different uh, exemption periods, right? Four months for seasonal worker, six months for seasonal employee. And I got a whole heck of a lot of confusion. Yeah. (laughs) And what Representative Renasi said is there is no reason in the world that there should ever be two definitions for the exact same employee. So let's just make it one definition, and let's use the definition that says if an employee is working in a position that is only open for six months or less, he's a seasonal employee. And you don't have to count seasonal employees if you're a small club trying to figure out, hey, do I or do I not reach that 50 threshold? Mm -hmm. And you don't have to offer, if you do meet the threshold and do fall under Obamacare, you don't have to offer them health insurance if they're seasonal employees. Definition of seasonal employee, again, um, uh, in a position that's only open for six months or less. So now we got clarity. We got one definition, one determination, one six-month period. Uh, we, it clarifies without a doubt that guess what? Hey, no matter what, don't worry. These individuals will not have to be offered health insurance, regardless of the number of hours that they may work during a week. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to worry about figuring out seasonal work or seasonal employee. Google and see. I've had clubs <laughs> say, well, we Googled and it says seasonal workers. You don't have to offer insurance to. Well, no. Well, I don't have to count them, but if, if I have over 50, then I have to offer to other folks, but I don't have to count these. No. You know, it, it's very, very difficult for folks to understand. So we're pleased the STARS Act, again, two-page bill, uh, is something that we think can be a bipartisan legislation that makes a normal, sane adjustment to Obamacare that is a simple fix that helps small businesses, most importantly clubs, figure out how to comply appropriately with a very, very complex law. And unfortunately, uh, that's not been the case So, uh, as the law is currently written and the regulations. So you got, comp- you got the law, you got the regulation, four months, six months, seasonal workers, seasonal employees, it's just silly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're, we're working hard to make sure that that gets uh, passed. And with luck, maybe at the end of this year, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to attach this small bill to something bigger and get it through because it really... Uh, doesn't cost anything to the government. It's non-controversial. It's bipartisan. Mm-hmm. You know, good gracious, how many times can you say that about anything going on in Washington? <laughs> not, not very often, Brad. Well, I really appreciate no. you, you coming on and explaining all these things to us. I mean, I can't imagine what a, what a day in the life of Brad Steele looks like, but uh, it sounds well, like it's complicated. Well, I drink a lot, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I see that on TV all the time. Lawyers and politicians are always <laughs> opening up bottles because it's true. Yeah, right? you know, uh, I'm just trying to make sure that I keep the profession up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I got one last question before I let you go. It's the question I asked all my guests, and I hope you have uh, something prepared here. It's the bucket list question. If there's one club I've got to see before I die, Brad, what club is it for you? Uh, you know, it's funny. I've, I've had the pleasure of, uh, uh, because we, we're just honored to represent and have as our members, clubs like Baltus Roll and clubs like Atlanta Athletic, and clubs like Augusta National, and Medina, and L.A. Country Club. But uh, I know I've, I, I got to say that from a, a private club world uh, club, you know, not so much the Whistling Straits is great, but it's public facility or Pebble Beach or the Blue Monster. But from a, from a private club perspective, I tell you, one of those that just has a, a special, obviously a special, special uh, background in history, and one that would be on that bucket list would certainly be Augusta National. I haven't had the pleasure yet. So if uh, if anybody's out there listening from our member club, I always call down and say hello right before the <laughs> Masters. And for some reason, they don't pick up the call. I thought oh, I was important. I ain't that important, clearly, Gabe. No. <laughs> but, uh, no, Grace that's, Creek, uh, you got to get it excluded from the waters of the United States, and maybe you'll have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. No, that's, uh, believe me, we're not just for them, but for everybody. But if that gets me on, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Brad. Thank you so much. If folks want to find out more about the National Club Association or get in touch directly with you, how should they do that? 
Sure. The, the, our website is www.nationalclub.org. It's all one word. Or they can catch me at steel, S-T-E-E-L-E, at nationalclub.org. Happy to talk to them and, uh, and happy to, to tell them what we're doing to, take, to make the private club industry hopefully a little better and to keep everybody uh, playing long and hard on the course. We appreciate all you do, Brad. Thank you so much for being on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you, Gabe. I want to urge all of you to check out the National Club Association. If you don't know much about that organization, if you're not a part of it as a club, definitely consider joining. It's a fantastic organization that I've had the pleasure of getting to know this past year. Of course, we had Henry Wallmeyer on this show, the CEO, and we did the live show from their conference, the National Club Conference in Chicago, a few episodes back. They're just a fantastic organization, and they do a lot for this industry, and it's worth you checking out. Nationalclub.org is their website, once again. Another website you've got to check out, of course, is privateclubradio.com. A few things on there, privateclubradio.com slash vote, where you can vote for the next subject that you want to hear on this show. And of course, the new segment we're doing that I mentioned earlier, Inbox, privateclubradio.com slash inbox. You can leave us a voicemail question and Rick Coffey and myself will answer it live on this show next week for you. I can't wait for that segment. It's going to be a blast. And until next week, here's to your membership success. Just because this round is over doesn't mean you can't enjoy the 19th hole. Check out privateclubradio.com for more. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Shake Creative, the premier marketing and design firm helping prestigious clubs increase and retain their membership. Visit shaketamper.com to learn more.